Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully we are back and live. So let's go ahead and uh, hope that uh, everything stays the way it should. Uh, I'm going to try to switch over to um, Zoom on the computer, and hopefully that'll make the sound a little better as well. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so we are going to go ahead and lower this, make sure everything is going as it should. Okay, good. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, begin with our comments on uh, step 14. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and begin with Steve. What were your overarching uh, feelings on step 14 on the clamor, wicked master, the stomach? Well, so we're really talking about uh, gluttony here. Mm -hmm. And uh, all manner of sin can be said to be, to, can, uh, uh, or descends from the lack of control that really is what gluttony is. Um, and uh, I, I noted also that uh, towards the end, when he's going into some of the details of, of, of those various different sins, uh, there's kind of like a distinction between the ones that he attributes to the to his sons and the ones that he, or the, the, excuse me, not his sons, to Gluttony's sons and Gluttony's daughters. And like, for example, uh, on the, the firstborn son is the, minister of fornication and the second after him is the hardness of heart and then sleepiness. But just a couple of examples on the daughters are uh, laziness, uh, familiarity in speech, jesting, uh, obstinacy, conceit. You know, so it's it seems to be at a, at a, at a bit of a different level. Uh, I guess what the way that it's, it's looking at this is that, uh, given just a little bit of thought, is that if somebody's going to attack you in a dark alley, not to sound sexist, but a big man is more likely to cause you more harm than a woman, uh, just because of her body strength and physicality, just more weight, there's more power there uh, to cause more violence. Uh, so that might sound sexist, but I think that's where um, St. John is going with by having the differentiation between these giant uh, children the, as male children and the, while no less evil, uh, not as powerfully bad uh, sins as daughters, if that makes any sense. And yet slothfulness is one of the seven deadly sins. Correct. So... Like I said, well, it's, deadly. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that he uses the term sleepiness, you know, which is, I guess, is, you know, might be laziness, sloth, uh, slothfulness, or just being not in the present. Sleepy and slothful are not exactly the same things. No, but laziness. He says the daughters are laziness. Mm hmm Correct. Laziness, sleepiness, and sloth are all kind of tied together. And we'll get to sloth, because sloth is in the latter. Um, one of the principal deadly sins. That's one of the main ones. But right now we're looking at kind of the... Because you can tie all of these things together into uh, overarching themes. 
Uh, but definitely we're looking at some of that. Pat? Well, and I noted the consistent connection that he makes between gluttony and uh, fornication or lust. Yes, and, and I will draw the, the, the correlation between that. Pardon me? I will definitely draw you the correlation between those two as okay. the close of this chapter because there is there is a connection uh, there, believe it or not. It might not seem like it, but it definitely is there. But I'm hoping you can uh, illuminate. Also, I noticed that he kind of segues then into uh, the fornication idea in step 15. Mm hmm Yes, exactly. You know, it's kind of like how uh, Dr. Ed has said in a couple of other previous steps that it kind of there's a, there's a line going through here. Yeah. There is a there's connective tissue. There's a reason why he's linked these two together and why he put uh, gluttony before fornication. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ed. Yeah. You know, overall, I was reading this um, kind of with something you said last week in mind about how talk of Talkativeness and gluttony are kind of linked by the fact that they're both a type of incontinence or an inability to control yourself. And so, um, you know, I was kind of reading this section with that in mind and it kind of was helpful. And then um, I liked at the end where he kind of, you know, it wasn't until the end until he kind of stated, you know, what all these things were, the children of gluttony. Um, but one of the things that was interesting was I thought, you know, and I've seen it come up in other places, is that the sin of Eve was essentially a gluttony, an incontinence, an inability to control herself through food. And then that was the entry of all these other sins into the world. Correct. And that's that's why this is kind of the, the, the baseline of what's important for us to conquer this first. Because if you don't conquer this first, almost nothing else will be possible. Uh, Dr. Tobias? Uh, I think the overall thing, kind of like was brought out before, is that gluttony is tied to practically every other sin. I mean, uh, it just brings, <clears throat> they all come together here. And then here again, it's the chicken or the egg. Uh, yeah. Uh, I did, I did find that he, uh, <clears throat> it seems like he does have a, uh, a sense of humor when, uh, which one is it? Uh, 27? Uh, I thought that was funny. Yeah, uh, uh, 27. <laughs> the example he used, he, it's, uh, a whole but Egypt, he's yeah. All the seriousness, and then he comes up with an example of uh, uh, <clears throat> the you know, he's devouring all of Egypt and drank the drinking the Nile. Nile, yeah, yeah. And he's still unsatiated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And has that all happened to us once or twice, where you're at a big dinner, a banquet? You've eaten more than you could possibly eat, and yet somehow you're like, oh, but I'll eat this too, and I'll eat this too. <laughs> um, Mrs. Tobias? Yeah, like why desserts tempt us so much, like, oh, I'm so yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, in England, they would bring the dessert tray in a, in a little cart, you know, when we were stationed in England at, at the restaurants, yeah. uh, the, well, not restaurants, the uh, places where you eat. Usually at a hotel, they have an area that's an eating area, even though you, you're not at the hotel, but you're eating there anyway. Anyway, they at the end, they bring, I mean, amazing, they bring the little card and these tarts, these amazing desserts. I mean, you just had a half stub. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. Uh, but overall, you know, at first I was thinking they were talking about gluttony, like eating totally. But I realized as I was going through it that we're talking about gluttony in more than just more than just the stomach. My impression was that it was more than just the stomach. Gluttony of all things, in other words, insatiability. Uh, you know, that's where indulgence. Uh, yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah, and that with with. Um, Eve doing the apple to Adam. It's like all his fault. We all would have been pure if it wasn't for him wanting that apple. Yeah. 
<laughs> but overall, that's what I was looking at. The gluttony is um, you know, gives birth to all these others, but also gluttony itself. You know, at first I was thinking just food, but then he'd be talking about other things, and I realized, well, no, it's not just food. No. Yeah. So gluttony really is the gateway drug. Um, that basically gets us to all other sin. It is the, the beginning steps of, of, it, of as uh, Dr. Ed was talking about, the idea of it, the incontinence of it, the fact that you have no control. And because you have no control over your stomach, you don't have control over your eyes, you don't have control over your ears, you don't have control over your uh, senses. And this is why, and we'll get to it in the next chapter, why our senses can betray us. And this idea that basically our physicality, our body, uh, isn't to be trusted even uh, because we do not have self-control because gluttony has such a vice grip on us. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and delve in. And uh, if you have multiple ones, because obviously these two um, chapters are, are rather long uh, and I debated whether or not to link them together, but I'm kind of glad we did because obviously they are almost like one mm -hmm. solid piece. Um, so if you have you know, a couple that you want us to address, we'll go, we'll go ahead and go there. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you. You mean on, on, on the particular numbered items? Yeah. Okay, so my favorite here, uh, and I guess I'm a little partial given my background, is 32. Do not be deceived, you will not be delivered from Pharaoh, and you will not see the heavenly yeah, Passover yeah. Yeah. unless you continually eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Un and bitter herbs, this is the coercion and pain of fasting. And unleavened bread, this is a mind that is not puffed up. Let this be knit into your breathing. The word of him who says, but I, when demons troubled me, put on a sackcloth and humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer stuck to the bosom of my soul. So I, I love, love how St. John does these analogies, how he uses... Uh, these similes and uh, really kind of, you know, uses the metaphors to really kind of get you to understand what he's talking about. The bitter herbs and the unleavened bread. The, you know, the idea, because what does leaven do? Leaven rises the bread. So that is, it's, it's humble. <laughs> it, it, it stays down. Uh, and the fact that the, the herbs are bitter, it's like, oh, kind of sticks in your craw. But how are you supposed to get deliverance unless you go through this? And this kind of tie in to say is like, well, just like as the Israelites did not receive their salvation except through this, neither can you. It's beautiful. This is the, these these concepts of the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread are are the heart of the uh, Passover seder mm -hmm. uh, that we've been through. You know, we go every year to except when there's COVID to uh, our cousin's Passover seder, and you know, and that's what we're eating. The, you know, there's a whole. I mean, there's a whole spread of food. But first, right. you have to eat the bitter herbs right. and and the oven unleavened bread, and all the rest of our prayers are not going to mean anything. They're not going to stick to us unless we go through the, that suffering. Mm -hmm. Suffering that has meaning. It's not. That's the thing about it. It's not empty. It's not just suffering for suffering's sake. It right. has you know fruits. You know. It's it's like a, a prize fighter preparing himself for for battle. I mean, he there, there's you know no pain, no gain, as they say in the gym. Was there any others, uh, Steve? Before we move on to Pat, well, I'll let others. Okay, I'm following up on what Ed uh, was uh, making the connection between our last step of talkativeness and the current one of gluttony. So I was looking at number 24. I underlined the part, the tongue is strengthened by a lot of food. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is, is that the more we glut ourselves, the less control we have. And right. So this is especially true with, not just with food, but most especially with wine. That the more uh, we drink, the more we become loose. Uh, uh, the more we're, we're just letting go of things instead of realizing that we need to hold on. And so the, the fuller we get, the less focused we become, the more apt we are to make a mental mistake on what we do. 
Uh, this is one of the things, and we, we'll get to it towards the end because I don't want to take away necessarily if one of the, uh, your favorites was the last one, but um, to really hearken the idea that what happens when you overeat? You get sleepy. You get sluggish. Your mind doesn't work as well. Uh, right. You've heard me say this before about fasting that, you know, again, to the analogy of prize fighters, is that when you're trying to dodge punches, uh, you don't want to be sluggish. You want to be sharp. You want to be able to be reactive. You want the synapses to be firing really, really fast. And so in order to do that, you need to be just a little bit hungry. Eat enough that you're not starving, but not overeat so that you're able to stay awake. And this is very important because... As we saw the, the, link, the link to talkative is, talking leads to destruction of relationships. Right. That's the, the direct correlation here of overeating, lack of control, basically by overindulging our stomach and overindulging uh, the palate, we are not able to silence ourselves when we need to be silent when a thought comes to us that is inappropriate. Yeah. Well, and yeah. he says... Stint your stomach and you will certainly lock your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, you, we, we also, um, and I was just thinking this as you were talking, is, um, you know, there's long-term consequences also of gluttony. And mm -hmm. there's a whole host of, of diseases that we become more susceptible to if, if, if we're continually over, overeating. And... Um, and, and, and so that speaks to the lack of control over our, over our whole body. Exactly. Um, Dr. Ed, I don't know if Dr. Marine is in the background, but uh, what is like the percentage of deaths that are related to uh, heart disease, which is mostly preventable by <laughs> lack of gluttony? Do you have an answer to that? <laughs> she disappoints. She doesn't know off the top of her head. <laughs> but it's a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> to that diabetes. Well, yeah, I mean, because they're, they're, they're related. You know, I can't remember, was it type 1 or type 2 diabetes that is related to obesity? But he, uh, this isn't to, like, fat shame people, by the way. This is uh, something that's very, very important. And to kind of uh, give that connotation of not fat shaming and uh, this, I do want to share a story of a certain monk. So there was a, uh, an abbot of a monastery uh, who would uh, eat two plates of food at every meal. Have I uh, told you all this story before? No. No. This abbot would eat two plates of food, and his uh, brothers, um, the, or not exactly brothers because he's, he was the abbot, but the, the other monks would only eat one plate of food. And so there began to be grumbling amongst the, uh, the brothers, like, oh, you know, this guy, he's talking about fasting, he's talking about self-control, and look at him, he's eating two plates of food. He's a big old man. And uh, so the abbot, recognizing that there was uh, grumbling and problems uh, with the brothers, uh, decided to teach them a lesson. So he had the chefs cook up as much food as possible, more food than they could possibly eat. And he told the brothers, he said, I want you tonight to gorge yourself. We're not fasting tonight. I want you to eat as much as you possibly can. And so they ate. Some of the brothers had two plates. Some of them had three plates. Some of them even went as far as four plates. The abbot ate eight plates. Well, I can't even, look. Because his body was, you know, so massive. And by massive, I don't mean like he was a big fat man. I mean that he was just a very big man. Um, and so he told him, he said, look, you're fasting from one or two plates. I'm fasting from eight plates. Everyone's journey is a little bit different. And we need to respect each other. So I'm not sure where uh, Dr. and Mrs. Tobias went. Let me check if we're... Uh, well, Can I add another one? That absolutely. Added, that was like a counterpoint to gluttony, and that's number 33 about fasting. And he enumerates all of the good things that come from fasting. Mm-hmm. 
Fasting is the coercion of nature and the cutting out of everything that delights the palate, the prevention of lust, the uprooting of bad thoughts, deliverance from dreams, purity of prayer, the light of the soul, the guarding of the mind, deliverance from blindness, the door of compunction, humble sighing, glad contrition, a lull in chatter, a means of si to silence, a guard of obedience, lightening of sleep, health of body, which goes back to what we were talking about a moment ago, <laughs> agent of dispassion, remission of sins, the gate of paradise and its delight. So yeah, fasting and by its extension self-control uh, is our gateway to other virtues. So just as it's the, ver it's the gateway to, to our death through a lot of sins, it's also our gateway to salvation, which is one of the reasons why we've seen from the Old Testament from the very beginning that fasting and prayer go hand in hand, and without it, we can't win. This is one of the reasons why, again, if we look to the, uh, the miracles of Jesus, uh, when they brought the demon-possessed boy to him, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? And what did Jesus say to them? He said, this cannot be cast out except by prayer and fasting. What did Jesus say? Which earlier, he had uh, told the disciples, if you, the, the, the boy's father for this demon possessed child, if you have faith, even the faith of a mustard seed, you can do this. Uh, I'm going to mute uh, them. I'm not sure why we're getting an echo. Um, if you're watching it on Facebook or on, um, on another uh, computer, maybe mute one of the machines uh, so that it's not echoing uh, on, uh, on the Zoom call. Okay. So, Dr. Ed? Uh, I really like number nine. Um, often vanity proves an enemy of gluttony and they quarrel amongst themselves for the wretched monk as for a purchased slave. But one urges him to relax while the other proposes that he should make his tr virtue triumph. This idea that, um, you know, you can have two sins essentially warring against you and their only concern is your fall. It's not like they're, <laughs> but you can use your pride to kind of defeat the one down that you ultimately lost anyway. Exactly. And this is the, this is the extreme danger. Um, and there are times where at St. Uh, John has mentioned kind of fighting fire with fire. Uh, but in this particular case, using our pride to say, well, you know, for example, well, I'm going to will myself to fast. I'm going to will myself to beat gluttony. And ultimately, by doing it with pride and by thinking to yourself that somehow, ah, I did it. I accomplished this. Then you set yourself up for a greater fall later. Or as we're going to see in step 15, you're setting yourself up for a worse fall because the devil can very easily say, okay, I'm going to pull back just a little bit here to make sure that the lighter ripping the rug out actually going to hurt you that much more. So, yeah, it's it's sick. It's um, it's almost like watching uh, wild dogs or uh, or hyenas kind of biting at each other as they're trying to rip into your flesh. Uh, so that's an excellent <laughs> it's an excellent uh, uh, one for us to look at, Dr. Ed. Any other ones before we move to uh, Mrs. Tobias? No, I, I would just say one more thing that I think is comes becomes clear in the next step in that he says that some people will try to justify themselves or it seems justifiable because these things are so natural. Mm -hmm. And I think you can apply that to this one as well. Food and eating is natural, just like the desires of the body. But he makes it explicit, especially in the next step that, you know, Nature cannot, you know, overcome nature. You need God essentially to overcome these things. And so any idea, any sense of pride that you have in 
you know, fasting well or something is, is foolish. It was, you know, only by grace. That's exactly right. And in the next uh, chapter, especially, it really, when he has a dialogue kind of against his, his um, self, as it were, um, you know, how do I beat you? How do I stop you? And to understand that it's only through grace. There is no short step on that. And when you recognize that you've, you know, gotten past that, that's why he ends the final uh, section of tonight's lesson uh, by stating that uh, if you beat this, then you have already passed into eternal life. You've already uh, <laughs> achieved the resurrection. Uh, Mrs. Tobias? Uh, yes, no, since, uh, I don't know, somehow our computer's acting up, so I'm on the, tele on the phone, but... Um, I had two things. One, um, 12, I like that because it starts out, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. Evagrius. Uh, Evagrius. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you, you know, I, I like the way he put it, you know, was afflicted by the evil spirit because he just decided, you know, a lot of people like this, they, they just know it all. Uh, but of course, he was a, uh, you know, um, what's that called? Heretic, I guess? Anyway, or something like that. Yeah, would you call him a heretic? Uh, no, I would not consider Evagrius necessarily a heretic. Some of his writings are actually really good, but that's a topic for something else. Okay, anyway, uh, what he was saying, that basically that, you know, uh, uh, when we are like want to have this and want to have that, you know, sort of like he's saying, well, dive right in and only have water and uh, bread. And you're saying that, like, that's not good because, you know, basically that'll make you fail because that's too much. And I like the analogy about basically asking a child to, you know, to, to climb a ladder with one step, just go straight up. And you can't do that. You have to take it, uh, you know, start, like you were saying with fasting, that maybe you, you just can't go in, you know, whole hog because you will fail because it's too much. And this is, you're right, because this, Evagrius' is, you know, folly in this case, and this is what St. John is basically getting at, is it's something that the demons like to get on us with prayer and fasting, is that they will tell you, you know, to, again, work on your pride, because what it is is a double-edged sword with your pride, is they will give you saying, oh, well, you need to do everything, and not just everything, but above everything. You should eat ashes, in fact. And you do that once, twice, and then... Predictably, after like the third day, you fall apart. What happens to you? You then say, well, I'm not even good at Christian. I'm worthless. And then your state is worse than before. Right. I, think, I was going to say, and then uh, despondency mm -hmm. comes in. Right. It's very deeply. And they had another one. I did not understand what he's trying to tell us in 11 about he's seen age priests bewitched by the demons, a number 11, and they gave blessings to young men, not under their direction to use wine and all the rest. What is he trying to say? He's talking about basically that uh, when they uh, have guests in the monastery that are not theirs, where they'll say, okay, you know, let's just let everything go, have wine, re release the lager, and... Uh, this causes problems for both his people and for the guests. In other words, you know, this is where he's basically saying, be careful who you yoke yourself to. If you see someone that does not have self-control, then even if they say, oh, go ahead and go nuts, then you would say, no, oh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to continue to fast. Uh, Dr. Tobias? Uh, well, you've already covered the main ones that just really stuck out for me were 33 and uh, the last one. Well, the last one was definitely a uh, powerful uh, yeah. where it really talks about what are the children of this. Right. Yeah. And the reality is that he, he says they're, they're more num numerous than the sands because this is the gateway to all of them. But let's look at, uh, at this thing, because my, uh, for my proceed to see a bad thoughts, my, uh, but learn at least the names of my firstborn and beloved children. My firstborn son is a minister of fornication, not just 
uh, not just fornication itself, but a minister. Like basically, I control it, I push it, I shove it. Um, the second after him is hardness of heart, and the third is sleepiness. So these three things are the sons that basically lead us to our destruction. Now, why is that? Because when we overeat, now I don't know if this is if if this is true. Um, this is something that I need to ask a medical doctor, but supposedly that the more you eat, uh, the more lustful you become. Um, the second one, of course, hardness of heart, is that when you are glutted, when you are just uh, full of yourself, then you really don't care about other people because you're only focusing on yourself. So that leads to hardness of heart. And of course, sleepiness, we talked about that before, that when you're full of food, you become drowsy. And when you're drowsy, you're less likely to basically put up a fight when the attacks come, invariably. Now, so what is the cor correlation between uh, the lack of uh, gluttony leading to fornication? So fornication, filthy thoughts, things like that, are directly tied to gluttony because gluttony is self-love. It is the idea that instead of looking to what I need to eat, I'm going to what I want to eat. I'm looking to sweets. I'm looking to delicacies. I, instead of looking at uh, what is appropriate, I'm looking towards other things. For example, he uses the example that uh, instead of focusing on the heavenly rewards of Pascha, I'm thinking about, uh, oh, I can't wait to eat that lamb after the resurrection service. Yeah, 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 yeah I remember that right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we're thinking about these things as opposed to thinking about actual things that are going to help us. So we're focusing on our self, which leads us to fornication, because fornication at its very nature is self-love. It is the ultimate of self-love and is the ultimate lack of self-control, because in that way we become, to quote uh, Dr. Ed a little bit, natural urges, and as a result we're becoming animalistic. And this is why sometimes you see in the prayers where they say that I am like the beast and worse than the beast. Because the beast, you could say, well, the beast has, you know, it doesn't have the human rationale. I'm a human being. I should be able to ration and to, to not do these things. But because I lack self-control, because I've given myself over to gluttony, now, now I've, I've led myself into that. And so when we are full of wine, when we are full of food, we are not sharp, we are not prepared, we are engorged, and so therefore we are more likely to engage in uh, these dark uh, sins. Does that make more sense, Pat? Yes, yes. Father, what is he getting at in point number 13? I don't understand that. Laugh at the demon who, after supper, suggests you should take your meal later in the future. For the next day at the ninth hour, he will charge the arrangements will change the arrangements of the previous day. Um, What's going on there? Basically, the idea that you should be consistent. Well. That the, uh, the demons will say, oh, you should eat later. Well, then you should eat earlier. You should eat later. Because basically, again, we're, we're trying to have lack of control, lack of consistency. And so, despite the fact that there are some diets that would say, try to trick your body by eating at different times, <laughs> what he's trying to get at here is the idea of, have self-control. Be measured when you eat, why you eat. And also the demon telling you to eat later because the later it gets, the less sleepier you get, the less likely you are to defend yourself. And so what they want is you to be ping-ponging back and forth without any measure of control over your circumstances. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. So let's go ahead and move into step 15 and let's uh, look at some of our overarching thoughts. Uh, Steve? Unfortunately, I didn't get to this one. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I mean, these were two long chapters. Uh, Pat, did you? Uh, no, I understood that we were just doing 14 and I gave Steve misinformation. I'm sorry. That's okay. You know what? Um, did Dr. Ed and uh, Dr. and Mrs. Tobias, did you read 15? Uh, yes. Yeah, we can continue with, we'll go ahead and continue on because there's definitely edification. 
uh, at your leisure, then I would recommend reading 15 because 15 For sure. is uh, it's the center of the book. It's the centerpiece. And really, it is kind of the most um, diabolical and really long. horrific of the um, of the sins that we encounter. Uh, and so there's a lot to kind of unpack here. Uh, Dr. Tobias, what, are, what were some of your overarching thoughts? Uh, well, it's definitely for monks. Uh, this, this is extremely, extremely hard to, uh, to practice out in the world. Uh, to an extent, and we'll, we'll get through this a little bit, but there is a lot there that, yes, on the surface is for monastics. But there is also a certain level that is there for uh, people that are in the world uh, and understanding the, um, the wiles of the enemy, especially when even though you may be married, even though uh, you have this relationship, that when you are alone, that uh, you can and possibly will fall prey to thoughts and darkness. Uh, Mrs. Tobias? Um, it, it, this was a very, very difficult chapter for me. I, I really found it difficult in a lot of areas to understand. A lot of things in there, it felt like if you let your guard down, that there's almost like subliminal messages you will get from the evil ones. You know, you think you're doing great, and then, you know, you relax, and then, you know, you're, you're carefree. Then these subliminal messages come in because you weren't prepared. Uh, especially during sleep, you know, and it talks about, uh, you know, when you should do prayers and such and so that you would wake up, you know, refreshed. And if you wake up tired or, you know, they were probably you were being attacked. And I will give one real quick story overall. I mean, I remember uh, there was some time, a long time ago, I was having, I mean, really terrible dreams. I mean, it seemed like demons and such were my dreams. It was very scary. And I prayed, and I don't know if someone told me or what. I wasn't wearing my cross at night. And I, the next, uh, finally, I guess it was like, this is really bad, these dreams. And I decided I better wear my cross. And I have to tell, after, you know, I said some prayers and I wore the cross, I never, ever had those dreams again. You know, and I think that's what he's trying to put is that we have to be on our guard all the time. That is absolutely correct, that we do need to be on our guard 100% of the time. And we're going to get into that a little bit, too, the idea of uh, subliminal prodding and triggering uh, that is going on, that, you know, this warfare is constant. And this is one of the reasons why he says again and again and again, on this side of the grave, uh, it might not be possible to completely win this one. You're going to well, fight it to the I felt like oh, like you 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 can't win by the time you're thinking like okay I'm I'm on my way it's like that's when you're going to fall I mean Well this is ties into what Dr. Ed was talking about in the previous step with the idea of pride leads to the fall and that's why you know there is no beating this outside of grace and it has to be understood that way Uh Dr. Ed yeah, this was a, a very long chapter, um, but there were a couple of key points in it where I think he sort of expanded the conversation beyond just um, what we typically think of as fornication. And he talks about, um, you know, one of the them in particular was like a sensual person shuns, um, shuns solitude. So you're always seeking like stimulation in for your eyes for your touch and that this this follows naturally from the conversation about gluttony how you're looking to just satiate yourself and so i think um this idea of chastity and he talks about purity and he speaks about how these things are um you know essentially putting on the nature of god um and i I don't want to get too off base here, but I think he's expanding the conversation to other forms of sensuality um, that a chastity, you know, a temperance, 
are, these are the approaches to sort of these, these vices. Correct. And good that you put that he expands the conversation because he is uh, talking about the idea of temperance and um, um, I can't remember the word that he used, but basically in one of the steps he says that the one that fell from heaven uh, had never eaten anything. Um, and so but that was pre excuse me, that was the previous step. But basically the idea that, as you said, that uh, that this is something that is uh, you know, expanding a little bit more than just what we think. Uh, Dr. Tobias, let's go ahead and start with you for one of your uh, points. Well, this is so long I was going through just to find where I had marked by the number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 33, uh, I thought was, uh, but then 33 and 34, and, I mean, 32, 33, and 34 just all seem to tie together. Uh, that'd be a long discussion. But, uh, well, it's, it's an important one, though, which is to say that, to read 33, and our merciless foe, teacher of fornication, says that God is very merciful towards this passion as it is our natural foe. Ah. But if we observe the guile of the demons, we shall find that after sin has been committed, they say that God is a just and inexorable judge. They said the former in order to lead us into sin, and now the latter to drown us in despair. This is the one-two punch that the evil one is continuously trying to do with us, not just with fornication, but basically all sins. The idea of saying, oh, God's love, he's, you know, it's okay, he gets it, he understands. It's natural. It's part of your natural humanity to need this. And then after you fall, to say, oh, God is a judge, and now you're going to be judged. So get you to sin, and then despair on top of it, pride on top of it, because despair is pride. And so you have the double fall. And so that segues into 34, as, a long and as long as sorrow and despair are present, we do not so easily abandon ourselves to further sin. But when sorrow and despair are quenched, the tyrant speaks to us again of God's mercy. So do you see how it's a pattern? <laughs> because on the one hand, you're sad over your sin, and you're despairing, so you're not going to sin, even though you are sinning in that way. But the second that you drop that despair, then he comes at you again saying, well, God's merciful to try to keep it going. And 32 kind of led into all that because you had made a, a point earlier about death. Mm -hmm. And this kind of tied right into that. Like, but he who extols the former urges that for the dying, or rather the falling, there is no cause whatever for despair. Which goes back to the devil saying, you know, well, God's merciful. Yeah. Mrs. Tobias? Yes, I had, uh, oh, it's really hard because there's a lot of a lot here. Uh, one I enjoy, I'll, I'll say that one, that was 82, where one of the uh, brothers could not find a place. He was trying to find someplace where he could be quiet, and he ended up in the uh, place. Uh, uh, he couldn't find a suitable place for secret prayer. He wanted to pray and not be disturbed. So I guess he went to the, I guess their outhouse of sorts, and that's where he prayed. And he said something about, I pray to drive away unclean thoughts in order to be cleansed of all impurity. And I just, I just sort of enjoyed that because, you know, it's like you could go find any where to go. So that, that kind of is a segue from the previous one. And I'm, and I'm not going to necessarily read it right now in case that's another person's. But uh, the idea that basically physical physicality in your prayer Look, physically look up. If you're not able to look up with your soul, look up with your eyes. Put your arms in the sign of a cross to basically, you know, be fully present in your prayer to get out of this. 
to basically when you're feeling dark thoughts to really get into your prayer in order to free yourself of it. And so for this particular monk who was being assaulted and under attack, he could not find a place to, because, you know, obviously you're not going to start doing this, you know, in the middle of company. <laughs> Uh, and looking up and saying, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me. Um, so he went to an outhouse <laughs> in order to be able to do what he needed to do. So it almost sounded in that prior one, too, that, that you should, like, uh, like do damage to yourself or hit yourself or put yourself in pain. Or am I reading that wrong? Well, to an extent. I mean, I mean, if we look to, like, for example, the gospel this past Sunday, I mean, the, the publican beat his breast because uh, he was, you know, he wanted to feel it. He wanted to basically to, 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 to be cognizant of his fall, of his sin. Uh, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's, it's kind of like trying to, to wake yourself up from the stupor of your sin to get out of it. And the only thing I can kind of uh, compare it to is like when you're driving on the road and you're starting to fall asleep and you'll pinch your thigh to try to stay awake. Now, is that self-harm or are you just trying to, you know, Keep yourself vigilant. It's basically say, wake up. You know, see it too, it's like slap yourself. It's like, wake up. You know, to be physical with yourself, to basically get into it because you're not, they're not there yet to just do it in your soul. Okay, then I have uh, two others, 88 and 90. In 88, I'm trying to figure out, is he trying to say that... You can't really ignore, like you, you can't really placate and you can't ignore evil things that are, uh, uh, you know, attacking you. You have to acknowledge it. The 88 is really looking at basically the, the tightrope that you're walking in trying to control your body. You do it too much, you're going to physically kill yourself. You do it too little, your body's going to basically take over and do whatever it wants, any kind of lust, any kind of gluttony, any kind of uh, fornication, your body's just going to do it. So you have to basically walk this tightrope, this careful, you know, steps to control yourself without killing yourself. And this is one of the reasons why I can't remember if it was in this one or in another one where he basically says, this is why you need a spiritual father. You need a guide. You need somebody to help you because to try to do it on your own, you're going to, it's going to fall apart quickly. Does that make sense? Well, it says I embrace him and I turn away from him. But that's his, the closing line. Basically, I embrace my body because I got to take care of it, but I also turn away from my body because I do not want my body to control me. Oh, okay. So it's... it's yeah, when he said I embrace him, I'm thinking like, is he? What is he embracing? The evil. When he's saying him, the the him he's talking about, he's talking about his body. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. So it's it. it's a paradoxical um, thing that he's talking about here, and he continues in eighty nine and finally answers it in ninety. Okay, because yeah, because ninety, well, eighty nine leads into ninety also, and it was saying like. Um, Basically, are you, are you, is he saying that don't fool yourself, your, your flesh is talking to your soul, and, uh, you know, basically trying to, I guess, say, oh, don't worry, or something to that effect? I mean, I'm Well, let me, let me read 89 to just kind of get into it. So what is this mystery in me? What is the meaning of this blending of body and soul? Because both are seeming to be contradictory. How am I constituted a friend and foe to myself? Tell me, tell me, my yoke fellow, my nature, for how shall I not ask anyone else in order to learn about you? In other words, only person that knows you is you. How am I to remain unwounded by you? How can I avoid the danger of my nature? For I have already made a vow to Christ to wage war against you. How am I over to come your tyranny? For I am resolved to be your master." To basically have control over your body. To not be a slave to the tyranny of your body and its desires. And that's why it's a very hard thing because if you go too much as a master, then you are going to kill yourself. Case in point, um, St. Seraphim Sarov, who is famous for you know being on his knees for a thousand days uh, on a rock. 
was asked, you know, what spiritual uh, uh, gifts did you get from that? He says, I found a way to destroy my knees. Because <laughs> it was too much. It was, it was, it, uh, it did not benefit him. Oh. You know, this is a, a spiritual giant. He's the one that wrote on the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he is amazing. Uh, if you have not read that book, please do. Uh, it is incredible. It really kind of speaks to the nature of what the meaning of life is and how we should be seeking uh, the Holy Spirit and its and His gifts. Um, but as far as on his knees, which is where you see most icons of him, uh, he declares it was not physically beneficial to him. He was never able to stand or walk the same way again. So you have to control your body without destroying your body. And this is seen, you know, typified in the greatest monastic, St. Anthony, because when St. Anthony died, he was completely upright and he had all his teeth. And for somebody to live in the, uh, the fourth century with all of his teeth and still be upright and live to be a over 100 years old, that means he took care of himself in addition to having complete control over his passions. So it's a tightrope. Does that make sense? Uh, Father, I had a big star by 90, which was a right. continuation of 88 and 89. Right, and right. And flowed right into it. Right. Go over that. And the flesh might say in reply to its soul, I shall never tell you anything which you do not know equally well, but only of things of which we both have knowledge. I have my Father within myself self-love and this again is the most dangerous horrific thing that we encounter the fire which i experience from without comes from humoring me and from general comfort in other words the more you give attention to your body and its desires the more you're going to lead yourself to sin the fire which burns within comes from the past ease and bygone deeds have you noticed something very very important you will forget the most beautiful sunset you ever watched. You will not forget a filthy thought. It will come back to you. The devil will keep messing with you. So past ease, past deeds, those will continuously come back. Having conceived, I give birth to sins, and they, when born in turn, beget death or despair. If you know the deep and obvious weaknesses, which is in both you and me, you have bound my hands. Now, what does that mean? If you know the weaknesses, what is to know yourself? What virtue is that? Humility. Humility is to know who you are and what your weaknesses are. Because what do we say in another place? Another place that said... Don't worry about other passions. Fight one at a time. <laughs> Focus on it. Because if you know who you are and you know where your weak spot is, you can attack it. You can bind it. If you starve your appetite, you have bound my feet from going further. If you take the yoke of obedience, you have thrown off my yoke. If you obtain humility, you have cut off my head. The way I liken it to when I'm talking to my spiritual children is the idea that uh, the devil likes to use uh, shotgun rounds when he's trying to uh, attack us. Uh, for those that don't know how firearms work, a shotgun is a shell that basically uses a bunch of small little bullets to try to pepper a, uh, a target. Because contrary to what some people think, the devil doesn't know your thoughts. He doesn't have the same abilities as God. So he throws a bunch of thoughts at you, hoping one of them will stick. And once one of them sticks and penetrates into you, then the devil goes, ah, now I've got you. Now I know what you, I know what's, mm-hmm. And we see this in other places here where it talks about the unnatural thoughts, unnatural desires, especially for those that are trying to be uh, monks or prayerful people, is suddenly the weirdest thoughts and desires start popping into their heads. And so at that point, the devil is going to switch over from a shotgun to a rifle. Or more pointly, a sniper rifle, and always aim for that spot. 
And so if you know in advance where the devil is going to shoot you or hurt you, what should you do? Arm yourself in that spot. Fight for that spot, knowing that that's where he's going to attack you. Pointed spiritual warfare. Uh, Father, there was one part, and I don't remember where it was, where it talked about this uh, monk, holy monk, who I guess it was talking to a woman or had, you know, ate with her that she was visiting. And prided him, well, I guess pride, maybe that was the thing, the word. Uh, he was not succumbed. But then it said that the evil ones were happy because that led him into something worse that the other was less if he had uh, thought about the woman, so to speak. But this was worse because I guess he felt so there were two, there were two, there were two, I'm not, I, I don't remember which ones exactly they were, but there were two ones where they, where this happened, where one was a monk prided himself because, and this is where the devil works, he did not have thoughts when he was talking to a woman. And he thought, okay, I'm good. I'm not having problems uh, with fornication or dark thoughts as I'm talking to this woman. And he prided himself, and pride was the issue. I'm fine. I don't, I don't need to worry. And then in the privacy of his cell, that's when the thoughts attacked him. That's when he fell. But this other uh, instance, which is probably when you're referring to, is this man was holy, and he was with a woman, and he thought, oh, I'm going to move her to compassion. And so he started talking to her about salvation and trying to save her, not realizing that he had not saved himself yet. That's why he called it a false humility. And so she, beguiled by the monks' uh, talks of salvation, started talking to him. They started you know, coming together more, and eventually one thing led to the next, and the fall was great. So it's very, very important that we understand our weaknesses and understand when is appropriate for us to uh, try to help someone else with this, and when it's more appropriate for us to just say, you know what, I need to stay in my lane. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Because I was thinking like, oh my goodness, he's doing everything right. And, well, I guess not. You know? I, I've said it to you before. It's like somebody trying to dive in. You see someone drowning and you know the, you have compunction. You're like, oh my gosh, I should help that person. Not realizing that first of all, you're a lousy swimmer. <laughs> Just because you can maybe dog paddle for 10 feet, you think to yourself, well, I can swim. No, you can't. Uh, and then you think you're going to swim out and save somebody. What, what's going to happen? That person's going to kick and you're both going to drown. Uh, only what you need is you need to get a life preserver and then throw that to the person. Uh, Dr. Ed? Um, one of the ones that I had highlighted that you already talked about pretty extensively and did it very well was um, that idea of targeted guarding that one area, that one area of sin that um, you're sus especially susceptible to, and that was number 41. Um, he who sees that some passion is getting the better of him should first of all take up arms against this passion. Um, and it talks about killing that Egyptian, that, that sin that is your primary sin, and then you will see God in the bush of humility um, and then the, another one that I liked, which kind of fits in with the ones that were being discussed here about the monks being able to, um, um, you know, converse and be around and then be around women and somehow not be affected. But number 60 was interesting because he knew someone who was, it says, someone told me of an extraordinarily high degree of purity. He said, a certain man on seeing a beautiful body thereupon glorified the creator. And from that one look, he was moved to the love of God to a fountain of tears. And then he goes on to say how it was wonderful to see how um, what would have been a cause of destruction for one was for another, the supernatural cause of a friend. So this idea that somebody who is sensual can look upon something and, you know, it could be their absolute destruction, mm -hmm. but someone who is pure, which he defines earlier as putting on, um, putting on God as much as humanly possible, essentially. 
they can discern the true nature of things and then the same thing would which would be the destruction of one person is causing them to glorify god for this beautiful creation and moving him to tears and bringing him salvation so it's 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 a that's a powerful that's a powerful one as well it reminds me of a uh of a line in the uh, saying of the Desert Fathers, I believe it was Abba Piman, uh, who was walking with two of his disciples, and he came upon, upon a courtesan. And his two disciples, they put their heads to the ground and kind of buried their heads in the sand, like to not look at this uh, woman uh, who was, you know, dolled up to the nines, had the most expensive uh, gown on, makeup, jewelry, etc. And uh, Abba Piman, like, stared at her, watched her go by. And then turned to his disciples and goes, wow, that's incredible. And they looked at him with almost like disbelief, like, how could you look at her? And he said, did you see what she did? She put every ounce of her being into pleasing her customers. Her makeup's perfect. Her dress is perfect. Her jewelry is perfect. Her perfume is perfect. Everything to attract her client. And that could not have taken her like five minutes. That had to take hours to put together to set herself up. She put all of that effort into this. And do we put that kind of effort into attracting our God? That's incredible. So he was able to marvel at her industriousness, despite the fact that it's a sinful industry, <laughs> uh, and see the good. Because he had, he had just like the, uh, the, the holy man that St. John is referring to, he had reached a plateau where he wasn't looking at the sensual. He was only seeing a person and work. Uh, he was seeing, you know, the effort that someone put in and wondering, how do I, how do I attach that to me? How do I see myself and my feelings? Um, but this is one of the reasons why when we really look at this, this step and why he closes it by saying, this is the 15th reward of victory. He who has received it while still living in the flesh has died and risen, and from now on, experiences the foretaste of future immortality. So someone that has beaten this is essentially already in paradise because they've beaten the flesh. Because this is the absolute depth that a soul can basically crater. And he mentions at another place too that, uh, you know, better that you've never fallen in this. <laughs> Uh, because then instead of starting at ground zero with the ladder, where it's hard to climb up the ladder, you are basically starting underground. Uh, but what's a couple of things that really, really take out of this too is um, praying to actually start with a prayer to say, understanding that you don't have control and just say, Lord, I am weak, help me. That was one of the most powerful moments that uh, I think I saw in this, uh, was when he was talking about what to do, how do you confront this, something that is essentially unconfrontable. And he basically said, acknowledge your weakness and say, Lord, help me. I'm weak and I can't do this without you. Um, just absolutely a pow powerful moment. Let's see if I can find one. There's another one that I just had to chuckle where um, where it basically said that for those that know this stuff, you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to forget it. And for those that don't know it, it's better that you don't know it. <laughs> oh, where were you? I laughed at that one so hard. <laughs> uh, but basically, the whole point of this is to master the clay, the body to have self-control over your body and not be moved by your body to quote unquote unnatural and even unnatural impulses. Uh, final thoughts, I know we ran a little late today but these were two very long uh, chapters. Yeah, I, uh, Father, I had a couple I wanted to ask you about real quick. Sure. Um, first of all, I like 69 because it talks about when you, that the holy angels are there helping you out where they say that if you work up and happy and good and ready to go, like those are angels encourage you. I like that. But I had 74, I didn't understand really what he was trying to get at. And 73, I wanted to ask you, what is he trying to say? That it was a good thing women, he said the good load shows his great care for us. 
in that shamelessness of the feminine sex is checked by shyness, as with sort of a bit for if the women, if the woman were to run after the man, no question be saved. What is he trying to say there? I don't like what I'm hearing. Uh, so <laughs> keep in mind that this is written at a time when women were viewed as a certain way, um, you know, shy, uh, you know, demure, uh, having to be coaxed to do things. His basic idea is that men are the animals <laughs> and that men are the ones that are uncontrollable. Basically saying that if women were as uncontrollable as men, then we would all fall into basically despair of sin. Um, okay, that sounds better. Maybe we're the ones holding things together. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't understand 74. What is he, I mean, that was very hard to understand. Okay, so yes, this one is uh, a little difficult because he's basically talking about how we encounter fornication. Uh, and there are different types and uh, it's basically how your soul is encountering it. So let me read it in its entire, entirety. Uh, so in the rulings made by the fathers, a distinction is drawn between different things such as attraction or intercourse or consent or captivity or struggle or so-called passion in the soul. And the blessed men define attraction as a simple conception or an image of something encountered for the first time which has lodged in the heart. So remember when I talked about the idea of the shotgun blast by the devil? Yeah. <laughs> Where basically an image is just, bam, it's there. You didn't look for it, it just happened. What are you going to do with it? Intercourse is conversation with what has presented itself accompanied by passion or dispassion. That's the second stage of sin. Where, okay, it hits you, it logged. How do you deal with it? Do you just go, you throw it away? Or do you go, huh, interesting. Let me think on you more. And consent is the bending of the soul to what has been presented to it. So consent is now, this is the next stage of sin where you're like, oh, I like this. I really like this. Whatever that is accompanied by delight but captivity this is where it's a little bit different is a forcible or involuntary rape of the heart or permanent association with what has been encountered which destroys the good order of our condition so for example someone that has encountered something um, horrific whether they were shown something or experienced something especially somebody that has experienced uh, sexual trauma let's say um, you know, that is not something that they had control over. Uh, and so it is something that they will probably never forget. They will probably never be able to get away from it entirely uh, because it's always going to be there. Now, how did they you know, deal with that is something else entirely. Struggle, according to their definition, is power equal to the attacking force. In other words, when you're fighting with what is actually happening to you, which is either victorious or suffers defeat according to the soul's desire. And they define passion in a special sense, as that which lurks disquietingly in the soul for a long time, and through its intimacy with the soul brings it finally to what amounts to a habit, a self-incurred, downright desertion. So passions is when that dark thought, even if you don't act on it immediately, stays inside of you and waits for a moment of weakness to come out. And once it has happened once, it tries to happen again to establish habit. And once habit is established, then it becomes almost intractable to get out. Of all of these states, the first is without sin. So in other words, when you get attacked, when, when you get a thought that happened to you, that's not sin. The second is not always, but the third is sinful or sinless according to the state of contestant. Struggle is the occasion of crowns or punishments. In other words, so for the first one, basically, it basically means that how did you interpret? Did you enjoy what was happening to you as it was happening? Then that's sin. If not, then that's not sin. Uh, the third one, which is the struggle, is the idea of whether or not you're going to win against your battle of what you're dealing with. Um, it is Captivity is judged differently according to whether it occurs in the time of prayer or at other times. It is judged one way in matters of little importance and another way in the case of evil thoughts. But passions is unequivocally condemned in every case and demands either corresponding repentance or future correction. Therefore, he who regards the first attraction dispassionately 
cuts off at a single blow all the rest which follows. In other words, if you can have Kevlar so that when that barrage of, of shotgun pellets hits you and it just falls off, then you're so much the better because then you have not entered into this basically progression of sin. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it was a good thing you were here to explain because it was very difficult for me, anyway, to understand what he was trying to get at. So these are the stages of sin, and it could, you could just as easily, you know, be talking about fornication, some sensual image, but you could easily put this, it seems like, in the anger section. Yes. Or a remembrance of wrong will somehow spark mm -hmm. you to sort of entertain your hatred of someone. Correct. Absolutely. And it all stems to the idea of self-love. Where does the anger come from? The anger comes from the idea that my uh, will was somehow abrogated or I was somehow wronged. And so this self-love of you is where the devil basically says, okay, that's the weakness. That's how I'm going to be able to get these thoughts to attack you. And we all have that where, you know, a thought will hit, hit you and you're like, what is that? It doesn't have any implication on you. You just throw it away. And yet those thoughts persist. And when you give in to a thought, the thought keeps coming because the devil tries to build traction with it. Is that like, you know, the Greeks have a saying, uh, let's see, you know, I hold on to it, but it doesn't cool off. It doesn't go. Correct. The more you, the more you hold on to it, the worse it gets. All right. Any uh, final thoughts? Uh, or uh, questions, uh, especially from Steve and, and Pat that are kind of uh, experiencing this chapter vicariously. Uh -huh. No, I feel like I need to sit down and read it and really there's some really deep stuff in here. I was kind of reading as we were going along and I came across one uh, short statement that I thought was telling. Um, when we talk about the other sins, we say that a person has fallen and when we talk about that the person has stumbled. But mm -hmm. when we talk about fornication, we say that he's fallen. Yes. It's as if we, we somehow understand that this is somehow worse. Yeah, right. Uh, this is tied into another one that was shortly after that where a monk asked him, he said, why is it a heretic can be immediately brought back, but why is somebody that gets yeah. fornication is, uh, you know, subject to... Right, uh, right. Everybody you know, sometimes years of, uh, of uh, excommunication. And that was the idea that with, you know, heresy, you betray with your mind, and that can be changed. With fornication, you betray it with your whole self. Uh, Father, I remember that portion. I remember I had, there was a so long, I had questions like on all kinds of things. One of them, I, re, I can't remember where it was, but that exactly where you're talking about, it talked about the Catholic Church. You're not talking about the Roman, they're talking about Catholic Universal, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, okay, Father, I have a, 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 I guess a, a general question, which I'm not sure relates to this, relates to a lot of stuff, I think, but, you know, obviously um, sin can lead to suffering, you know, our own, our own suffering. And, um, uh, and how, what is the relationship of that suffering to repentance, or how can we, how can we turn that suffering into repentance, a pet repentance? Uh, repentance is a change of mind. It, it's turning around, whereas. Um, Whereas suffering is a way of either experiencing the, the fruits of what we've done, or it can be something that is, you know, used as a, uh, a motivator to help us through. So in other words, where does suffering come into repentance? Suffering comes to repentance as basically a wake-up call. It allows us to, uh, to recognize that what we have done is causing harm to ourselves or potentially others. Um, for example, in my own personal journey, uh, when I was younger, 
I would notice that sometimes the timoria, the punishments that would come uh, from God, would affect me directly. Um, whether it was my, my thoughts or uh, the way I'd interact with other people, uh, I would find that I would be you know, punished in myself. But as I got older and more mature spiritually, I started to see that the punishments would not just affect me, it would affect other people, especially the people that I cared about. And so I started to recognize through the suffering the nature of my sins and how it is not you know, the lie that we all tell ourselves. Oh, it only affects me. No, it affects everybody and especially affects the ones close to you. And so that suffering was used as a catalyst to prevent future sin. The idea that do you really want to hurt the people that you love? And so suffering is a tool that is used in many different ways by our Lord, not as a good thing in and of itself, but sometimes as a catalyst for change, sometimes as a combustion to uh, help energize what we're going through. Hence the, uh, the, the talk earlier about the, the, the bitter herbs and the, the leavened bread to basically you know, go somewhere. But the idea that if we don't have suffering with meaning, then it becomes empty and can become seen as cruel or... Uh, as a punishment, as opposed to something that is uh, either a self-inflicted wound, meaning that God didn't cause it, I caused it, uh, or as something that is, you know, part of, you know, building strength in our journey. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. All right. And I think what we'll probably do uh, for next class is we will continue with 15 just a little bit because it seems like there is uh, more questions and thoughts and we're already at an hour and a half uh, into our class. Um, so we'll give uh, Pat and Steve a chance to catch up. And then um, we will continue forward with, I believe that, uh, let's see how many chapters can we go forward? Uh, 16, 17, 18, 19. We'll do through 21. Whoa, I hope they're short. <laughs> well, they're short. <laughs> After this one that you just had 80. Um, it was wow. All right, so for example, 16 is 10, 17 is 16. 18 is 6, 19 is 8, 20 is 20, and 21 is 12. So I think that that's short enough that we can uh, can get through them. So 16 through 21. 16 through 21. 15 through 21. Yeah. Okay. I hope they're not as hard as this. I mean, this... To me, it was very, very, it was long, but very yeah. hard. Yeah, so I think needed it. A, this needed its own session. Well, then, you know what? Let's go ahead and cut back. We'll, we'll spend however much time we need to spend on 15 uh, in our next class, and we'll get as far as we can. Read 21, and we'll just get as far as we can. They're very, very short, and they're not all as uh, complex as this one. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Have a blessed and wonderful night. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, Present all Place, and Fit in all Things, come and dwell in us. Cleanse every state and save our souls, O gracious Lord. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night. Okay. Thank you, Father. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Tobias. Good night, Father. Good night.